any questions or comments? Um, so uh, when Imam Ali told the pagans that uh, if the Prophet did not initiate a treaty with you, you have four months to prepare yourselves for war. Yeah. Um, what does it mean that um, it, it, it sounds, does this include only people who did not, who refused to sign treaties or I, I guess it sounds a little bit like you're imposing force on them, on people who had not ever entered into a treaty. I don't know if my question was clear there. Let, let me, so so you're referring to the declar the announcement that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam makes with, uh, the, the, the announcement that he makes in Mecca? Yeah. Where if, where, if, where if your treaty, your agreement does not have, where if, وَمَنْ لَمْ تَكُنْ لَهُ مُدَّةً So, so this is also referring to those who have violated the terms of the uh, the contract, because some some treaties had a duration, you know, a few months, few years, and there are some agreements that did not have a term limit. So the pro the, the Imam السلام, on behalf of the Prophet says that if you have a term limit and you have not violated the terms, we will honor that duration, and if you have an agreement with the Holy Prophet that has no term limit, your term limit is four months. And then after that, you have to make a decision whether you're going to align yourself with the Prophet's enemies or you're going to support the Islamic State because presumably these individuals are paying some type of tax to the Islamic Islamic government. So the the Prophet is not allowing anyone to take a neutral position because this is a, this is a, a time of war. So even those mushrikeen who did not violate the terms of the contract, they have to take a firm stand against those mushrikeen who have violated the contract and who refuse to allow an, an environment of coexistence to, uh, you know, to be uh, established. So what does it mean to align yourself with the Muslims? Does that mean to convert or is it something different that is meant? It, it doesn't necessarily mean to convert, but it does It does mean, you know, for example, in the Islamic State, you have, you have Jews, you have Christians, you have other faith groups. In times of war, it could be that the Prophet expected them to defend, to fight against them, that they join his, his army, but not, not necessarily become Muslims. This is also possible. Okay. And uh, in the uh, verse about the asylum, is asylum specifically meant in the context of wanting to hear the Quran, or is it like t asylum today as well, like where they're fearing violence from someone else? Now, the verse, I number six, this is seeking asylum with the, in with the intention of listening to the Quran, meaning to evaluate whether someone wants to become a Muslim or not. But again, they have the freedom to, to listen and reject. And even if they reject, they're still given immunity until they get back to, uh, to a place of safety. But in this context, asylum is granted if they, uh, if they wish to listen to the, uh, the word of God. Okay. And in Surah Araf, but, but, but that doesn't mean that you know Muslims are not permitted to grant asylum, you know, to a to a non-believer. In our fifth, we we believe that if a Muslim grants asylum to a non-Muslim, all Muslims have to respect that, whether or not that that individual intends to listen to the Quran or not. But here in this verse, what's being highlighted is that the effort to guide should never be suspended or interrupted even during times of war. Uh, thank you for the clarification. And in Surah Araf, verse 44, why is the collar between the people of heaven and hell? Because it sounds like uh, some place that's between heaven and hell would be of like a rank in between heaven and hell. And it seems like that's not the case. No, that's it, there's there's no... There's no middle ground in the sense that there's a place between uh, hellfire 
and paradise. Let me pull up the verse because uh, in Surah Al-Araf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that on the day of judgment, there will be individuals who are on these hills. And this is this is this kind of is a uh, so let me read the verse to you just so I'm not uh, I don't misquote. And these individuals who are on the Araf, they know they can distinguish between the believers and the non-believers. And they have, it seems that they have a say as to who enters the hellfire, who enters paradise. So ayah number 46, if you go to ayah number 46 of, of Surah Al-A'raf, And there will be a veil between them, araf, meaning between the people of hell and the people of paradise. And upon the heights, araf, something that's elevated, are men who know all by their marks. They know who's mu'min, who's kafir, who's from Ahl al-Jannah, who's from Ahl al-Nar. And they will call out to the inhabitants of the garden, Salamun alaykum, peace be upon you. They will not have entered it though they hope. Meaning that these individuals are doing shafa'ah. They're doing shafa'ah for the people to enter the paradise. And the ahadith indicate that these are the ma'sumin and the caller who makes a call in between the people of the hellfire and paradise are one of those individuals who are on the araf and the narrations indicate that the one who makes the call is Imam Amir al muminin So in between is a reference to the Araf, the heights on the Day of Judgment that is seen as you know, a, media, a, 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 a middle ground between the, uh, the Hellfire and Paradise. Because he's on the Araf. So it's kind of like a position between two entrances or two entrance doors almost. Yeah, you could you could look at it though. Assalamu uh, alaikum, Sheikh. Uh, there's a humble request from me that yes. uh, when you quote uh, hadiths, uh, please mention the names of the books and uh, and also mention the number. Okay. When I mention a hadith, mention the reference. You mean? Yes. Yes. Okay, inshallah, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Thank you. And then I have one more uh, question, Shaykh. When uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks in uh, this uh, surah, Surah al barar uh, first he mentions in, uh, in ayah one, he mentions mushrikeen, and then the, in ayah second, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that God brings shame unto the infidels, that's kafiri. Mm. So, uh, and the rest of the art, it talks about uh, mushrikeen. So kafirin are not mentioned here at all. So what is the position of kafirin here? So let me let me look at the uh, the verses. It's a, it's a very good observation. It, it hadn't even occurred to me, to be honest with you. <clears throat> so your question is that why is it in, so in ayah number one there is a mention of mushrikeen in ayah number two, so ayah number one mentions mushrikeen yeah. ayah number two kafirin now the the verse is speaking about about the same group because you know if you look, if you look at the flow of the verse it's not that Allah is speaking about two different groups so the mushrikeen are are, are mushrikeen in the sense that they ascribe partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they're polytheists they believe in multiple gods so the first ayah is highlighting you know that aspect of their aqidah 
I number two, now you can, a mushrik is also a kafir. So they associate partners with God. And they're also kafir in the sense that they they have rejected the omnipotence of God on the one hand. They've rejected the messenger. So just because mushrikeen is mentioned in one verse and kafirin, we should not think that Allah is speaking about different groups. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is highlighting you know, different aspects of their aqidah. You know, so on the one hand, they associate partners with God. On the other hand, they reject the Holy Prophet. You know, they reject Qiyamah. So a mushrik is also a kafir. And in many cases, these kuffar are also mushrikeen. So there's overlap. So it's essentially highlighting, you know, different different aspects of their uh, of their aqidah. This is just my, my humble understanding. I haven't, the tafasir that I have read haven't really delve too much into you know why one some verses end with mushrikeen and others end with kafir this is just my humble insight thank you Shaykh. Anything else? Anything else? Uh, well, uh, and i number five when it says so when the sacred months have passed then yeah. say the idol letters wherever you find them and see yes. them and beseech them and lie in wait for them in every ambush. Yeah. So, some light on this, uh, you know, and lie in wait for them in every yeah. ambush. Now, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he says lie in wait for them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically speaking about a military tactic. So, you know, on the one hand, Allah says, you know, kill them wherever you find them. You know, capture them. In some cases, you won't need to kill them. You just capture them and that's sufficient. Sometimes there, there will be certain scenarios where it's better to capture them, to collect intelligence from them. Other times, it, the, 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 the battle will just be too heated. And the best way to, to deal with, with, with the, the situation is to kill them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he says that lie in wait and ambush them, is highlighting a military strategy that sometimes with these enemies you have to conduct a surprise attack. So the ayah is simply mentioning a, uh, a strategy, a military strategy that the Muslims should, uh, should consider when, when fighting these individuals. That take them by surprise. You know, don't don't expect them to come to the battlefield. You know, you know, many of them are going to be hiding. Many of them are going to be plotting. So this is a tactic that you have to uh, employ. So lying in wait to ambush them is to, to to basically understand that this is this is a a tactic that you need to use because you're dealing with a very dangerous enemy. These these are not individuals that are going to have the honor and the dignity and the courage to come and face you in the battlefield. So you have to kind of uh, be very vigilant and, uh, and treat them as the, 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 the vicious enemies that they are. So this is just highlighting a, a, a fighting strategy, a military tactic. Okay. Uh, Sheikh, there's one more uh, question. Sure. Um, when it is mentioned about the sacred four sacred months okay so can you just name those months please now we shouldn't confuse al ashhur al hurum in this ayah as the four sacred months that we know because the four sacred months that we know that existed even during the time of jahiliyyah are the qada the hajja Muharram and Rajab. These are Al Ashur al Huram. That even during the time of Jahiliya, the Arabs would not fight during these sacred months. But in ayah number five, when Allah says, When the sacred months have passed, what is meant here is that the months, the four months where the Prophet has given you time to prepare yourself for war. So these Ashur al-Hurum should not be confused with the four sacred months that were known to the Arabs during the time of Jahidi. Because this announcement 
by Amir al-Mu'mineen on the was made on the 10th of the Hijjah and then you have you have Muharram you have Safar Rabi'u al-Awwal and Rabi'u al-Thani so these are the months that are meant in ayah number 5 by al-Ashr al-Hurum the four sacred months that were known during the time of Jahiliyyah are the Qa'da, the Hijjah, uh, Muharram, and Rajab. So we shouldn't, you know, confuse the sacred months in this ayah with the sacred months that uh, that were known during the time of Jahiliyyah.